Okay, so we're going to follow the same model as yesterday, and we'll just quickly go through this stuff, just so that way if you have questions, we can stop and pause, otherwise we'll just move on to the new stuff. Okay, step three. So, so basic character characterizations of living cells. They grow, they need to reproduce, they need to be responsive, they need to metabolize. Okay, so coli versus paramecium. What's a paramecium? Prokaryotic, eukaryotic, archaea? Eukaryotic. Mm -hmm. Eukaryotic. Mm -hmm. E. coli. Prokaryotic, eukaryotic, archaea? Prokaryotic. Prokaryotic. Okay. Prokaryotes, remember we've got that complex cell wall. We've got a large circular chromosome. You have the nucleoid. What happens in the nucleoid? Why is Isn't this full of DNA? It carries all the genetic information. The nucleus in a eukaryotic cell has all the nu has all the genetic information. Nucleoid. We're in a prokaryotic cell right now. It's also in eukaryotic, but they don't have a membrane-bound organelle. So the nucleoid, the dense little part in that nucleus, it's where all the RNA is being made. Okay. So what's central dogma? DNA, DNA RNA, protein. Okay. So you got to make that RNA. Um, they lack basic organelles. They do have some, but like ribosomes, because if they didn't, why why do they need ribosomes? Protein. Make protein. Make proteins. Okay. What do we call round bacteria? Spherical. They are spherical, otherwise known as. Okay. And rod shaped. Bacilli. Okay. So. They get protection. So you either have the capsule or the slime layer. And the whole point is to protect them in one way or another, you know? Either protect them from the host defenses or to make it so that they have, they are prevented from dehydration and they can adhere to whatever they're trying to you know, join. Okay? Three pictures. The capsule, really rigid, tight against the cell wall. Slime layer, very loose, flowing. Because if it was really that wouldn't stick very well, kind of need it to have some give. Flagella. So, bacterial flagella have a filament, a basal body. Um, they're great for movement. There are three types. Oh, we go this way. So, um, what's the big difference between gram positive and gram negative cells? Positive and sticker, um, the pepto glycan wall. Okay, so the, the size of this wall is the major difference. You got a large wall, you're positive. You got a small wall, you're negative. You're also a lot more complex. This is a lot simpler since it's one thing versus this, which is a lot more complex. Okay, so you can see the inclusions, we can see the flagellum, uh, nucleoid, well, pretty much. Um, TEM. Anyone know what TEM is? Electron micrograph. It is electron microscopy. It's transmission. I think it's transmission. transmission. Electron microscopy. So it's a method. And I mean, if you think about it, we're trying to look at things that are what? 0.5 micrometers is what that little bar says. So really small. Okay. Three basic types. Anyone remember what these are? Polar. <laughs> Paratropolis. So, all over, you can either have a single polar or a top of polar. The other thing you can have is the endo. So, endoflagella means it's inside, rotating, it makes it so they, they're spiraling through. So, rather than having a whip like projection on the outside, it actually turns the organism, so it's like parasitic worms. So, what is tumble and run? Yeah. Where the flagella are not operating as a unit, but basically flaying around just to move more rapidly, tumbling. Okay, that's a tumble. And a run is? They twist together and then just kind of flip off. Okay, so, how, you know, so it's basically how they can try and cover more ground. Tumble, they aren't moving together, so kind of flails, go somewhere new, points in a new direction. Run, they're all working together. 
pick up speed. And Magellan, they can move, to make the cells move. So we have flagella. What are the two other extensions from cells from prokaryotic? Cilia. Cilia. What about pili? There's another one. Fibrin. Fibrin. Okay. So you have fimbria, just for attachment, allowing the bacteria to adhere to surfaces. And the pili is all about what? DNA transmission. All about sex with bacteria. That's how they do their sex. That's how they transfer their plasmids. Um. <laughs> I'm trying to make it easier to remember. <laughs> okay, so remember you have the flagella are the largest, then you're going to have the fimbria, and then the pili can be larger than the fimbria because you've got to reach that other, other bacteria. Um, and how many pili are you going to have probably per cell? One or two. One or two, okay? So you're gonna have a lot, you have to think about need. You need to move, so you're gonna have either that one really strong one or you know, a bunch of them. You need to be able to adhere things, so you're gonna have a lot of those. You don't really need to be having that much sex because there's not that many around, so you only need one or two of those. Okay, there's a little pillow. Transferring information. Talked about biofilms. Basically, then being able to use that glycosylase to, and the um, fibria to attach. And the problem is they're resistant to a lot of disinfectants and antibiotics. Um, so, well, so we're going to get into, um, well, we might get to gram staining today, but that is in the next section at least. So, but gram positive, gram negative. So, gram positive. Purple. purple, they have what kind of cell wall structure again? Thick one. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. So gram positive has a thick one, gram negative is that really thin one. So this is what we're looking at is that thick um, peptoglycan layer versus the thin peptoglycan layer. So gram positive, gram negative. What's one of the bad things about a gram negative? Or what's one of the things we really need to worry about as far as treating patients and if you all of a sudden kill a bunch of gram negative bacteria, you get an accumulation of what? That's a problem? Lipoglyceride. Today, which is part of the LPS. So, structure, highly structured. There's sugar molecules that have been modified. This is what is making that peptoglycan. This is what's giving us our support and rigidity. So, just a nice picture so that it's visualized. Again, tetrapeptide is a what? Four amino acids. Many sugars put together. Tetrapeptide is four amino acids. Peptide is amino acids. Tetra four. So, that's what those little blue things are in between the sugars. I hope that's a question. Okay, here's the LPS. This is what the lipid A that we were talking about earlier. So, Problem is that if you end up killing a bunch of gram negative bacteria, you're going to get an accumulation of this lipid A, and that can cause fever, um, shock, things that are generally not good for humans. Acid bacteria. Um, so, some of the cell walls, they'll. So, okay, we always usually go gram positive or negative, but also some of them have a lot of, you know, acid, this waxy lipid layer and stuff. And so, we are going to be talking about a little bit later some other stains, some fast acid stains, so that we can actually figure out as a way to help differentiate what actually, what bacteria this is and where. So we have multiple stains because you need to be able to differentiate easily from all of these other bacteria. Make sense? Okay. Fluid mosaic model. What does that mean? The oh, lipid bilayer, it's um, fluid though, it moves. Okay, so the lipid bilayer, so now we're not talking about the outside of the cell, but we're talking about that cell membrane. You have the lipid bilayer, the lipid bilayer, um, and you have proteins in that lipid bilayer. They can all move. Um, a lot of times we actually have cholesterol in there, which is kind of an interesting thing, and it's when things get heated up, the cholesterol adds rigidity, so then it doesn't just completely melt apart. And then when it gets cold, the cholesterol 
adds fluidity basically to it, makes it so that it can still move. And so it's kind of one of those nice little things that helps it stay fluid. Okay, nice pretty picture of this. We have a lipid bilayer. Um, the heads are hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Hydrophilic. So they like or don't like water. Heads are like attracted to water. Okay, tails so tails in here, this yellow, don't like water. The lipid layer. You get some integral proteins go all the way through versus the peripheral proteins. Questions? Okay, we talked about moving membranes across, uh, moving molecules across, across the membrane. What are the two types of uh, diffusion? Facilitated and oh, active. active. Facilitated and active. What's the difference between those two? Active means ATP. Active means energy. Energy. Doesn't need energy. Okay, whether or not you have to use ATP. So, whole point getting proteins and substrates inside. So, facilitated, no energy required. Active, energy is required. So here we have a nice little picture. And facilitated, you go with the concentration gradient, then you're going to be facilitated. It's easy. It wants to go that way. So as long as you either have a non-specific channel that it can go through, or a very specific channel it can go through, it'll flood into the cell because it's going with its concentration gradient. Sort of question. Is the channel actually opening and closing, or is it just being forced open by the material uh, coming through? For the um, or facilitated. No, for the specific, it actually can change the shape, and so it binds. So then, the binding of that one substrate will change the channel, so we'll actually drop it in. And it doesn't require any ATP to change the but shape of the channel. But it's just because of how it comes in. And that's how it's specific. So it's because the material if coming in that's changing else, the shape of it. Yeah, you know, if the round came in, it wouldn't open. So that would just come back out again. But only because this specific substrate is going in, it changes the shape of the protein and lets it drop in. You have to remember these are cartoons of the proteins. So these are just showing alpha helices and everything. So does that make more sense? requires ATP. Um, usually this means you're going against your concentration gradient. Transport system. This was something that only some E. coli do. And so where they're actually able to alter a molecule as it passes through the membrane to prevent it from escaping. So they want to accumulate sugar. So when they get the sugar in there, they then are going to change it so that it has to stay. It's not able to get out. Osmosis, just water moving across the membrane, trying to even out the amount of solute on each side. Okay. So. If the solution, remember, it's all um, comparative. If the solution, there's the same number of solutes inside as outside, isotonic. If there are more solutes outside than inside, Hypertonic and give up its water to try and balance that out. If there are more solutes inside than outside, it is a hypotonic solution and all the water is going to rush in. Okay. Question? Make sense? Okay, we talked about the cell. Talk about nucleus, ribosomes, inclusions, just cell storage. Size, eukaryotic cell. Okay, so the basic structures <coughs> that are important. Nucleus. This is where I house all the DNA. We also have nucleolus, where the RNA is being made. We have mitochondria. This is what? For energy. Energy, ATP synthesis. Um, centrioles, what are those for? Structure? Attachment. The Attachment. Those are for, yeah, they, they help with the cytoskeleton, get them all organized, pulling them apart the microtubules. Golgi, what does the Golgi do? Packages, packages, packages and transport. 
packages, modifies the proteins. Mm -hmm. um, endoplasmic reticulum, we have two kinds. What are they? Smooth and rough. Okay. And what it makes it rough? The Okay, ribosome attached to the outside of it. Good. Um, Oh, lysosomes, how about those, what are those? Enzymes, they take things in and bring them back. Digestive enzymes inside of them, protection, okay. So, I think we've talked about ah, new stuff. So, eukaryotic cells. Now, we eat by putting food in our mouth, but they don't really have mouths, so how are they gonna take in nutrients? They go through a process called endocytosis. And so this is the uptake of substances into a cell. So it's, I mean, very simply, basically, they kind of find something, they make a big, you know, hug around it and pull it in. So you can see the different stages. So chemotaxis. So basically they're going, ooh, something good's over there. We're going to kind of grow that direction. So they want to get this and they will then adhere start building this little pocket, start ingesting the microbes by phagocytosis. So endo means in, so it's bringing it in. So phagocytosis is if they bring food in, if they bring liquid in, it's pinocytosis. Okay, so they're gonna ingest these microbes by phagocytosis, they're gonna go in. Our Golgi has been kicking out, transporting things, making little lysosome packets that have all sorts of um, digestive enzymes. So this lysosome is going to match up. So by the way, this keeps a special membrane around those microbes. Because even though the eukaryotic cell wants to eat it, they're like, you're foreign. We don't want you as actually part of our cell. We want you segregated in your own little special membrane vesicle. And that's especially good because then you take your lysosome, which has all these digestive enzymes, which would digest the cell just as well as it would digest anything else, <laughs> and you fuse these two together and you basically release them. So they start to break these apart, and you know, then whatever you want, the cell wants or needs, they can kind of take it, and then the rest of it just spit it back out into the environment. And that's your exocytosis it out. So endo coming in, exo going out. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. So endosymbiotic theory. So we talked about there are a couple of organelles that have double membranes. One of the things about eukaryotic cells, they have membrane-bound organelles. But a couple of the, the organelles have double membranes. And so this has led to the endosymbiotic theory. So the idea was that you have a pro, you know, prokaryotes evolved first. You have this big prokaryotes going along. It ate a mitochondria, or it ate you know, the precursor to mitochondria. It ate another cell. And it didn't digest it. It just kind of let it live. and over time, it kind of lost, it lost its ability to reproduce, to um, live on its own, and it became useful. So they ended up getting kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, so because both the chloroplast and the mitochondria have double membranes, they have their own DNA. So a lot of the DNA has been transported off into the nucleus, so they can't survive outside of a cell, but mitochondria replicate on their own. They are they don't require the nucleus to tell them when they can replicate. They just do it on their own because they have their own DNA. Um, actually, mitochondrial DNA changes so rarely. Um, all of us have mitochondrial DNA from our mothers, and so when they're trying to track back through your maternal lineage, they'll use your mitochondrial DNA because Myself and my brother had exactly the same mitochondrial DNA because it came from our mom. And so, you know, your genetics is a mixture. Mitochondrial is purely maternal. And so this is where a lot of times also because it's a smaller subset, it, it mutates 
very, very low, low numbers. I think it's like half a percent every million years or something, so it's like a ridiculously low mutation rate. So a lot of times when they have like World Trade Center, they weren't doing genomic testing, they're doing mitochondrial testing. Because they could easily test for this and it's a lot smaller and they can know, okay, this was your child. And, they will, and this is how they were able to do the DNA typing. Um, also, this is one of the sad things. Is, is a bit, um, there's been horrible things in war where they've taken pregnant women, taken their kids from them and raised them with the enemy or whatever. And then years later, finding this out and then trying to put them back with their grandparents because the moms were killed. And so, but by tracking through maternal lines, you know, mitochondria, you can do that because the grandmothers, maternal grandmothers, have the same mitochondria as their grandchildren. So, it's useful, it's sad, but, um, so, endosymbiotic theory, this is, they think, because ribosomes also, um, you know, we have eukaryotic ribosomes, they look like bacterial ribosomes, which is slightly different. So it's a theory, it's thought of, um, it's not, not everybody believes it, but it is one of the theories, is that they just, you know, a bigger prokaryote, you know, endocytosis some smaller prokaryotes and let them live. And that's how we got mitochondria and chloroplasts. Questions? Okay, Lodia. You guys looked at this yesterday. So this is a Lodia leaf tissue. So you can see that nice cell wall and chloroplast. Since we've been talking about eukaryotic cells so much, but we've been looking at animal cells. Animal cells don't have a cell wall. Um, they also don't have chloroplasts. That's something that's special to plants and to some single cell organisms like algae, fungi, and stuff. So and then up close, these are these little chloroplasts, and as you can see, they don't really have any specific spot they are. They circle around um, because they constantly are moving within that leaf, so that way they're constantly giving everybody a shot to get as much sunlight because there's that light and dark reaction to photosynthesis. So they circle throughout the cell. Okay, soil microbes. So this is one of those things where for a while, people are like, what's the name? They can't, they're, you know, they mate asexually. So what's going on? This is kind of when they're first really starting to realize and understanding that, okay, this sucks. Basic soil bacteria are becoming antibiotic resistant. And this is what's really a problem in hospitals, is that because of that pill act, the bacteria can kind of mate and pass on. So all of a sudden, you'll have this super bacteria that is resistant to all of these different antibiotics. And so it's, you know, it's really becoming a problem, especially if you take something that is pathogenic to us, and usually you can kill it with an antibiotic, but now you can't because it's gaining resistance to those antibiotics. Yeah. You, I've read in several places, but would you agree that the primary reason that, my, that microbes and bacteria are developing is resistant so readily is because of the tremendous amount of antibiotics which are just randomly being dumped into animal feed? Um, that could be some, so it's out there more. A lot of it also is people don't take all of their antibiotics, so what will happen is 